Thank you. Thank you very much. I was uh, slightly nervous before. Now I'm super nervous. I've never had people sitting on the floor for a, for a presentation before. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Mihir Nayak, Dr. Mihir Nayak, since two weeks, which feels amazing. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that, was, that was new. Senior lecturer at Oak Shula Fresenius, marketing speaker, author, hotelier, owner of India's only couples hotel in Goa, um, travel journalist and, and, and a consultant. I also do research, and this was, this was, where, it, uh, yeah, this was where it came about. Um, lovely to see some familiar faces, some friendly faces uh, in, the, in the audience. And speaking of friendly faces. Speaking of friendly faces, um, usually I have friends of mine that visit Amsterdam once in a while, and these are usually the pictures that you get to see. Maybe, maybe that one, this is a typical picture of Amsterdam. This, or of course, the I am Amsterdam. These, of course, pictures are the ones that are safe for work. I've, in, I've uh, removed the other ones, but this is what you would usually expect for somebody who's traveling to Amsterdam. Recently, a friend of mine from India traveled to Amsterdam with his uh, family, and these are the pictures that he posted, not on Facebook, but on Instagram. That one, that one, that one, and that one. This is the new kind of images that, are pe that people are sharing, that people are posting on social media, especially on Instagram, which brings me, of course, to my, thank you, which brings me, of course, to my topic, Insta food, how social media is changing the way we eat on holiday. Seems that people are spending more time looking at images of food and paying less attention to the actual foods consumed. This is something that a lot of us seem to feel. Many people wait until the food, or, or wait so long to take a, a photograph, the ideal photograph of, of food, that food, that the food actually gets cold before they're able to eat it. But they're fine with that because the picture is more important than the taste, or at least it seems that way. An Israeli restaurant, uh, Katit, went so far as to actually stage every plate for Instagram. You can see here they created special lighting conditions, and the plates actually, I don't know how many of you can see here at the bottom, every plate has a bracket for smartphones so that you can take the best photograph. This is the stage that we've reached um, right now. Food photography is one of the most popular posts on Instagram at the moment. Hashtag foodie, hashtag food porn, hashtag nom nom, the sound that you make when you eat, has over 20 million images on Instagram. In addition to that, you also have hashtag travel that features many culinary posts, so it, this number is certainly more than, uh, than the 20 million mentioned here, which means that Instagram and, and InstaFood is becoming a very, very serious, um, becoming a very, very serious topic. Which brings us to the question, and this is basically where the presentation actually started out, the concept of food or insta-food and identity, especially for the millennials. I see lots of young faces here uh, in the crowd. Could we, uh, could we have a show of hands? Who uh, among you are millennials born between 1980 or 1980, uh, 1985 onwards? How many of you are millennials in the audience? OK. Uh, Lots of you, I thought, I thought as much, so uh, yeah, when I'm, when I'm talking here about millennials, feel free to nod so I know that uh, yeah, you, actually, you actually agree with the things you say or shake your head strangely if you have absolutely uh, no idea what I'm talking about here. But this is the typical millennial, of course, there is no such thing, but that's the kind of uh, yeah, people that research was conducted on. Today's youth, the millennials, are rejecting the values of previous generations. 42% of millennials are drinking less than their parents. Crazy. Getting drunk, they say, belongs to an older generation. It's not cool anymore. And 71% prefer revitalizing smoothies over alcohol. I actually tested this. No, no, OK. Uh, I, actually, I actually tested this. I, I, went, I went with a friend of mine to, uh, to the supermarket. I picked up a bottle of gin. And he is, he, his hand reached out for one of these revitalizing smoothies. And I looked at him. I was like, really? He was like, yeah, man, you know, I'm not feeling like alcohol today. But a smoothie would be, uh, a smoothie would be really great.
It's gone as far as entering into the dating scene as well. If you wanted to pick up a chick in the East Village in New York in the 80s, you walked around with a guitar. Today, you're better off if you get a tattoo of a carrot on your forearm. May, might not work with all the young uh, ladies here, but this just gives you an idea of the direction that we're actually, that we're actually heading in. Previous generations, it was all about music, it was all about fashion, it was other things. Today, it is food that is the defining topic of millennials, or those of you born between 1980 and 2000, 2000 onwards. Here, we also speak about the so-called intimacy theory, where this says that especially millennials have a more emotional relationship with food. Food is more important to you than ever before. It's also, as it says here, a form of self-expression. Your generation is looking to food, making it, eating it, talking about it, learning about it, everything, with related, to, everything related to food, um, especially as a form of self-expression. Statement of who we are, what we believe, every meal can tell us something about ourselves, and you look, you millennials or the millennials, look at it as a means of expressing themselves. The reason why this was quite surprising to me, we'll get to it in the, in the next slide, why is food so important for the millennials? Because, and excuse my language here, it seems that millennials have a pretty shitty life. You can't afford to buy houses like your parents, you can't get great jobs, many of you are struggling, many of you are doing your internships or your, or your practicum, struggling economy, what you do have is sourdough bread. Quick show of hands, all the cool people among you, how many of you know what sourdough bread is? In German, Sauerteigbrot. Okay, quite a few people. Um, I actually discovered this during, uh, or well, well, while preparing for my presentation, I purchased a loaf of sourdough, sourdough bread. Take a guess in, in, in Cologne, in one of the hipper uh, bakeries, take a guess at how much this loaf of bread costed me. Any ideas? Nobody? I paid six euros for a loaf of sourdough bread. Yes, I know it's handmade, it's made by, by, famil by, by a family, continuing for, for generations and generations, but six euros for a loaf of bread seemed crazy to me. But it is expensive, yes, but it is still cheaper than a mortgage. And that's the way millennials seem to look at it today. It is very, very expensive, but they're willing to spend on food because that's the only thing they can afford to spend on. As one guy said, because I don't have much, I, I post pictures of food because I like food, but it's also I don't have much else to post about. This food for many, for many millennials is a way of pretending that you're living the good life. This sense of luxury, you can't afford a mortgage like I, like I said, but you can, really, you can afford some really nice sourdough bread. Again here, no money for a deposit, for a deposit, no money to insure a car or go abroad, but you feel better because you, uh, you are here eating before or after posting a beautiful piece of avocado toast. Avocado toast for all those who are the non-millennials here, the absolute hottest thing that you can be eating and showing your friends. If you eat, I haven't, I haven't yet eaten a piece of avocado toast, but if you've eaten that, you belong now to the cool generation. You are now officially cool if you've eaten a piece of sourdough, of, of avocado toast. And this is what's important here, that positive reinforcements of likes and comments make millennials feel that their life is okay, even if everything else is not working out. Food has become the new social currency via photo sharing apps such as Instagram, and it's all here about instant gratification. Millennials want to feel good about themselves, and the best and cheapest, most affordable way to do that is through food. Buying expensive food, yes, but still cheaper than uh, yeah, anything else that they could not afford. And this is, this is what it's all about. Posting a picture, immediately getting that bunch of likes makes you feel much better about yourself. Which brings us here, of course, to the role that it plays, uh, that Instagram and InstaFood plays in food tourism. Um, very, very interesting statistics, very, very interesting data that uh, I managed to collect here as well. The definition of culinary tourism here is based on this desire to experience a particular type of food or the produce of a specific region, which means that you need to travel, as the definition says, you need to travel to that particular de destination to get the authentic food experience. 
culinary tourism, about food exploring. And this is very, very important here for me, discovering culture and history through food. There is no better way to discover the culture of a, of a, of a place that you're visiting except through food. Eating what the locals eat is this focus on authentic, um, yeah, this authentic on, on food, food experiences, memorable experiences that, you're, that you talk about is what, what, is what drives many, many tourists uh, to travel today. This has always been the case since 3000 BC. We have examples of the spice trade where people actually traveled for food. This was, of course, in relation also to economics, but definitely plays a huge role here. In 1492, the Italian explorer Christopher Columbus also went in search of spices. So this is something, this is not a new phenomenon. It just seems with technology that it's sort of coming back again, as it were. These are a number of things that would include or, or activities that are part of uh, food tourism, be it working on an organic farm in South America, learning to cook yourself and prepare spicy dishes in Thailand, sampling bread at a market in France. These are just a few. I picked out just a few of the number of activities that culinary tourism involves and that are becoming more and more popular. And here, for those of you, I know some of you in the audience love figures. Uh, yeah, we can see the smartphones going up here. $8 billion a year in the UK alone. This is some serious money. This is not just a fad. This is not just a trend. This is some serious money that we're looking at here. UNWTO, according to its research, states that over 33% of tourist spending is devoted to food. And when you compare that, when you compare the price of a dish to, let's say, an airline ticket or a hotel, you, you can imagine how much, how important food is or how important food is becoming for um, travelers and tourists. Here, three very, very interesting statistics that I uh, highlight or that I'd like to highlight about how important food has become for people who are traveling. 62.7% say that I like to go to new places to try some new food and take pictures of them. 54%, over half of you, say that if I know of a new place through food pictures, I will go there and try the food. So looking on Instagram, posting photographs on Instagram actually makes you travel to the destination. If I know of new places through food pictures, um, I look at food pictures when planning a trip. And this, again, is nearly 50% of people who actually use Instagram as, as, as a part or as, as a uh, as motivation for, to, for choosing a destination. But who are these culinary tourists? Um, I've divided them here, according to study, into five groups. First, you have the laggards, 17 to 28%. They are not really interested in uh, local food. Unlikely to have purchased any food during the holiday. These people are not so clued in and not so interested. You have the unengaged. This lot of uh, potential because they're not negative towards sampling local foods, but they haven't, or, or food is not just that, that important for them uh, when traveling. Again, here, depending on the number of people that you uh, look at. The unreached. 15 to 17%, and this is the area that you need to focus on if you're, if you're in tourism, if you're in destination marketing, for example. Food can contribute to the enjoyment of a holiday. They're happy to try local food, but they're not doing so currently. You need to reach these people. You need to convince them that local food makes sense. It makes sense. It's beautiful. It's something that, of course, you can post about to your friends um, later. These are the people that we're focusing on right now, interested Food plays a huge role uh, in the enjoyment on holiday. They do try local foods when the opportunity arises, and they're also very active purchasers. So these are your best, these are your best influencers. These are the best people that uh, yeah, you want to uh, reach and you want to promote your destination. Last but not least, um, you have the food tourists. Very, very small percent, 6 to 8% here. Food is the main reason for choosing holiday destination, but they go more for good food rather than local food. So they would be willing to go anywhere. They're not so much uh, yeah, interested in, in, the, in, the, in the local, not necessarily interested in the, uh, in the local food. Again here, a uh, very, very interesting statement. Food tourism today is where ecotourism was uh, 20 years ago. This, this quotation was taken 10 years ago. And now you can see that culinary tourism and food tourism has, been, um, yeah, has evolved uh, quite, quite a bit since the statement was, uh, since the statement was made. 
which brings us here, of course, to destination marketing and the role that food tourism can play or should play in a destination marketing strategy. All of you in tourism know that this is a major problem. There's an increasing homogenization of tourism destinations. Most tourism destinations seem to look and feel the same. What can you do about it? Promote your local food, because your local food enhances the distinctiveness of a destination and makes it very, very difficult for other destinations to copy. This is local food only in your destination, only in your region, and that's what you need to, that's what you need to promote so as to gain this USP over your competitors. Most DMO marketing materials have started including food and drink operations. You have Australia, Canada, Hong Kong, Peru, for example. Today, I just found out only, only by chance that Germany is entering into this in a huge way. I don't know how many of you have heard or how many of you know, Germany or German, uh, German tourism has declared this year as the year of culinary Germany. They're promoting their, their food offerings from every state online. They're using new media. They're using, uh, they're using YouTube as well to promote the different kinds of food that is available in Germany. And I spoke to the person uh, just before coming here, and uh, she said that is because most people thought that the only thing you can eat in Germany is either a sauerbraten or potatoes. And they wanted to show that that is not the case. Food is evolving in Germany, and that's what they wanted to highlight. Uh, again, something that I just learned about um, Something that I just learned about today uh, here is Cologne. Cologne has started in, in, col in collaboration with uh, German tourism. Cologne, where, where, I, where I live, has started something called Culinary Cologne. So you have here, you have, they've, they've, created, they've created a number of uh, campaigns here to highlight the different kinds of um, food and the different, their, their rich culinary uh, tradition that they have in Cologne. So this is something that is happening right now. This is something the destinations are already working, uh, are already working on. Food festivals, very, very popular way of doing so. It's giving uh, tourists the potential to indulge in the local culture. Great popularity, of course, in recent years, this trend is increasing. And this, of course, is also one of the great ways to attract so-called influencers to the destination. For all those of you who don't know what influencers are, these creators who share content on Instagram, for example, other, uh, and other social, social media, building communities around topics, for example, such as travel and food. And I brought a few examples here to see just how important these influencers are. Chunga Ray or uh, Tam underscore delicious, 225,000 followers. This is just one example of the, uh, of the influencers who are out there in the food space today. Cooking Class C, 222,000 followers. Again here, posting delicious photographs of food. How can you make her come to your destination and, and promote your local food offerings so that other people also want to uh, come to the destination? 1.2 million. Deliciously Ella, um, one, of the, one of the more popular examples that I could find, 1.2 million followers who look at every picture of food that she posts. What are you doing to attract these uh, influencers? How are you including them in your uh, marketing strategies? 467,000, again here, um, Half-Baked Harvest, uh, again, another uh, example of an influencer who's very, very popular um, here. And food festivals make sense, they make economic sense. 250,000 people at the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival, 3.2 million at the food festival in the Philippines, 50,000 at La, La Tomatina. Food has become a major reason to travel. And this, of course, linked to the, linked to the trend of the increase in Instagram, is the ability, after you throw tomatoes at everybody you know and you don't know, the ability to post a selfie of yourself drenched in tomatoes to all your friends who have not been there. That is the motivation today of going to these, of going to these festivals here. Another example of a great campaign that I found, hashtag Restaurant Australia. Here you can see some very, very impressive numbers. Um, this, was, this was a very re relatively expensive uh, campaign, $8.6 million in advertising and in social media in May 2014. But look at what they got. 
20, 21, nearly 21.5 million YouTube views, 1.1 1, 1 million Instagram followers, and the rest of the figures here. What is most impressive here is on the, is on the left hand side. They managed to move up. Australia managed to move up from the 10th spot in the, in the ranking of top international culinary destinations to spot number three. That is what you can do. That is the effect of social media. That's the effect of using Instagram the right way. Ireland, another emerging culinary destination, Filthy Ireland, which is the official Ireland uh, tourism destina destination marketing organization, created the so-called Discover Ireland campaign. Here, you could get in touch with local Irish people who were in local um, food areas. And of course, they created a number here of food festivals. The Sheridan Irish Food Festival, Irish Whiskey Trail, to promote the rich cultural food heritage, um, food heritage that they have. There's growing interest in authentic local foods, which is amazing for you who are working in the destination who have anything to do with tourism marketing. Over 52% wanted to try local foods. Over 70% say that food makes a positive contribution to their holiday. There's also, and this was a topic that the organizers requested me to go into, the ability to eat with locals. As the, as the, name, as the name says here, eat with. This was one of the best practice examples that I found where you as a tourist can actually go to a destination and sample local food cooked by a local person. It does not get more authentic than this. Airbnb is moving into this in a huge way, trying to get people to go behind the touristic curtain, so to speak, that is normally off limits to tourists. This is all about the new, exciting sharing economy that we have today. Casa Chef, this is something that is uh, yeah, in, the, in the Cologne area and uh, in, other, in other cities as well. I think it's moved to Essen, it's moved to Dusseldorf, uh, to Dortmund. Here, again, giving people the opportunity to taste that local food and, of course, post uh, yeah, pictures of that traditional food then online on Instagram and elsewhere. Another option, very, very popular, cooking classes. Tourists go with the local villagers, go to the local villages, collect ingredients, and then cook together with the locals. What a wonderful chance to experience the destination, the actual way it is, rather than just staying in your hotel and then hiding in your hotel room. Exactly where, this is a traditional, authentic culinary tourism experience, exactly where the cuisine originates, which means it, gets us, it doesn't get more authentic than this. Tailor-made individual for those of you who are uh, interested. And of course, the best advantage is that you can take a photo like this and send it to all your followers on Instagram, making them jealous. You actually cooked this. This is something that you did. The expression on your, on your friends' faces, on your followers' faces should be wow. And that's what people are going, going with here. This was the last bit. Um, yeah, we spoke. We spoke about the relatively normal examples of uh, Insta food. I got. I, I also decided to bring you three slightly crazy examples of where Instagram has taken us. Those people who go out of their way to try the dangerous, scary, and the absolute crazy. First example here. Apologies for the images. Goat head culinary experiences, very, very popular in uh, Tunisia. People actually eat goat head, goat's heads um, cooked uh, in, the, in the local spices, and they also take photographs of it and then uh, post them to Instagram. This one was something particularly crazy that I, that I found out here. This is the so-called uh, puffer fish. This looks relatively harmless, but it is super dangerous. It's up to 12, 1,200 times more potent than cyanide, and it becomes a challenge whether you can actually eat this. What happens if you do? It can range anywhere from dizziness, vomiting, numbness, prick, prickling, rapid heart, heart rate, low blood pressure, and your muscles can even get paralyzed. But that's all some sort of part of the thrill. So you take a photograph of it, you share, you share it with your friends, and then everybody wants to know, how did you even manage to survive the experience? One diner nearly didn't. In 2011, he nearly died because he went for the extreme. He went to eat the fish liver, which is something that only very, very brave diners do because that's even more dangerous. And this uh, nearly, nearly bought him, uh, yeah, nearly cost him his life. It's this thrill, this danger that you then would like to post on, um, yeah, post on social media. And the third one, uh, yeah. Typically uh, American, if I may allow myself that uh, statement, there's the so-called roadkill grill. 
It's an annual event all across the US, which is particularly gruesome because here you get the opportunity to eat dishes that are freshly peeled from the road. Roadkill is something that, that people have run over, something that, is, uh, yeah, that has just been run over, and you scrape it off the road, you actually cook it and then post it on, uh, and then post it on Instagram. And this is, the, uh, this is the marketing slogan here. Did you ever see a dead raccoon on the side of the road and think, man, that looks good? If yes, then this festival is for you. And why do such crazy things? Because it gives you the opportunity to do this. It gives you the opportunity to do this, to post a photograph on Instagram of something that has just been killed, something that you're just about to eat, hashtag fresh. It's been an absolute honor. Thank you very, very much. If you have any questions, I'll be here right on the side. If you'd like to chat, otherwise it's been great. Thank you very, very much.